Dr. Evan Richardson. I first met Evan uh, via email when I frantically emailed him saying, I know that there's a research station in Pond Inlet. I'm coming up to Pond Inlet for six weeks. Can I stay there? And realizing I probably should have said who I am and what it is that I'm doing in Pond Inlet. Um, so Evan was very kind to uh, have a chat with me about that and open the doors to the research station where I was able to stay for a number of weeks. Uh, and he actually traveled up there when, uh, when I was up. So it was great to, great to get to meet Evan and understand his research. Uh, so Evan is a polar bear research scientist in the uh, Wildlife Research Division of Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, he first started working on polar bears in 2001 as a graduate student at the University of Alberta where he studied polar bear maternity denning habitat in the Canadian subarctic. Uh, he's been involved in polar bear research across the Arctic from the Chukchit Sea to Baffin Bay and has spent much of his research career focused on polar bear ecology in western Hudson Bay. Dr. Richardson's uh, research interests are broad and include understanding the evolutionary ecology of polar bears, their mating systems, population genetics, foraging ecology, habitat selection, and uh, influence of stressors. Examples uh, include contaminants, climate, uh, and industrial development on polar bear populations. Uh, and when Evan is not working, uh, he's quite busy and enjoys spending time with his family uh, and introducing his two young boys to the wonders of the natural world. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Richardson. Uh, thanks, Kent. Can I turn on the lights? No. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction and thank you everybody for coming out today to, uh, to uh, my lecture on polar bears, the ecology of uh, threatened species. It's kind of uh, fun for me to be back in Alberta. I, I live in Winnipeg now, but um, uh, I moved out to Alberta in 2001 and I lived here for 17 years. I did uh, my master's and PhD at University of Alberta, uh, working with two polar bear experts there. And I was actually fortunate enough to get a, a scholarship from the Arctic Institute during my PhD. Uh, um, so it's, uh, it's, it's fun for me to be back here after uh, traveling lots of ground and uh, to be back and uh, giving a lecture for the Arctic Institute and giving back in uh, a, a small way to, to what they do in terms of Arctic education and, and research. So uh, so my topic today is, is, is polar bears, obviously, a uh, um, very charismatic species. And I'm going to kind of give you a, a window into the life of the polar bear. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the general ecology of the species. Um, and then get into kind of some of the impacts we're seeing in terms of climate change. Um, you've probably heard lots about polar bears and climate change and in the media. They, they tend to get quite a bit of a attention. Uh, people refer to them as the canary in the coal mine for, for climate change impacts um, for species in the Arctic. And I'll be talking about some research programs I've been involved in through my PhD and long-term research that's been undertaken by Environment and Climate Change Canada in the Canadian Arctic over the last uh, 40 years. Um, so uh, I'd like to start off by acknowledging a, a team of people that I work with fairly closely. Dr. Ian Sterling is an emeritus scientist um, with Environment and Climate Change Canada. He worked on polar bears for 40 years in the Canadian Arctic. He was my master's supervisor. Uh, Dr. Andy DeRoche uh, at the University of Alberta was my PhD supervisor. Uh, Dr. Nick Lunn is carrying on the research that um, Dr. Sterling started, particularly in western Hudson Bay. Um, which I'll be talking about today. And, and David McGetchy is a, a new addition to our research team. He's uh, our wildlife uh, research technician. He's involved in running all of our field programs, which are fairly logistically intensive, if you can imagine flying off to the, the middle of the Canadian Arctic and, and living in a tent at you know, 72 degrees north. It takes, takes quite a bit of, bit of planning. So just some background on distribution and abundance of polar bears. Uh, there's 19 polar bear subpopulations in the world, around 20 to 25,000 polar bears uh, in the circumpolar Arctic. Um, these are the, the subpopulations that are defined by the, the IUCN. And Canada has around two-thirds of the world's polar bear population. So geographically, um, they're not really uh, split up equally across the Arctic. And one of the reasons for that is the, the continental shelf. So polar bears rely on marine mammals as a, a food resource, primarily primarily seals, and these shallow productive uh, waters over the continental shelf tend to support mole polar bears. So you get out over the Arctic Ocean and the densities are, are really low for polar bears. 
but you get into the Canadian Arctic Archipelago where generally it's less than 300 meters deep. There's lots of primary productivity, lots of support for a prey base, and that's what you need for, for an apex predator like polar bears. Uh, this is sea ice concentrations in, in the Arctic just uh, a couple of days ago on the, on the 19th of February. And you can see where the ice doesn't go as far as it used to in the winter time. This is the, the median sort of ice edge from 1981 to 2010. And so the ice really isn't going as far as it used to and it's melting back further and further uh, in the summertime. And what that means for polar bears is, is, is habitat loss. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about sort of the general ecology of the species and, and what that habitat loss means for the long-term persistence of polar bears in the Arctic. So polar bears are an ice dependent species. They require uh, sea ice to travel on. Uh, they mate on the sea ice, they hunt on the sea ice. The platform uh, is very important for them getting access to the primary prey, seals. Um, when seals are in the open water and the bears are swimming, they can't catch them, they're just too fast. So they either need to catch the seals when they're hauled out on the ice, when they're coming up through breathing holes in the ice, or catching young, young pups that are born in maternity layers on the ice. So they really need that platform to get access to their primary prey. Uh, in some areas, they actually den on the sea ice and, and multi-year sea ice environments. So really a critical habitat to the long-term persistence of the species. A little bit on reproduction. So they mate on the sea ice in, in the springtime, March through late May, but they have delayed implantation. So females kind of carry the embryos in utero, but they don't actually start developing until the fall time. Most females don't reproduce till they're five to six years of age. Some females wait a little bit longer. Um, and most males don't actually begin breeding later in life. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, male reproductive success later in the lecture. We have a a really good pedigree that we're able to start to understand uh, some of the variation in male reproductive success in, in, in polar bears. So this is kind of a classic shot from, from Churchill, Manitoba, uh, wrestling male bears, kind of testing each other out, trying to figure out where they're at in the pecking order. So when the spring breeding season comes along, they can uh, see whether they could potentially contest uh, access to females. And we see evidence of, of male-male competition in polar bears. So this individual has a number of um, broken canine teeth. So when males are sparring, they actually lock jaws sometimes and they can snap off their canines. They're also swatting each other with their forepaws. They have long hooked claws. And so this can result in quite a bit of uh, scarring in males. And typically we don't see this breaking of the teeth and scarring on the face till the males are you know, usually eight, nine, 10 years of age. That's when they're kind of re reaching their peak body mass and they're kind of competitive in the mating, mating system and uh, able to defend uh, females that are in estrus. On average, females have around two cubs, um, but we do see uh, triplet litters sometimes, so, um, uh, and also singletons, but on average, females have, have two cubs and the cubs are really small when they're born. So they're born in these snow dens they're about the size of a Labrador puppy. So they're, they're quite, quite small. Uh, they just have a thin coat on. And so they stay in the den with their mother for uh, around two and a half months um, until they can kind of reach size around 15 to 20 pounds. And the female will actually break out of her snow den, spend a week or two around the den, and then travel back out onto the sea ice in the springtime to start catching seals. Um, and the 27 years of research we have in the Churchill era, only once have we caught a female with quadruplet cubs. Uh, so that's very rare and it's been, been seen one or two times throughout the circumpolar Arctic, but um, uh, four is uh, kind of uh, a, an anomaly or an outlier. But one of the things we found with our long-term research in, in particular in Western Hudson Bay and in, in Manitoba is females will actually adopt cubs that aren't their own. So when we go out and catch bears and do research and take measurements, we also take a, s a small genetic sample from each individual. And we can actually look at the maternal and paternal relationships in our long-term pedigree now. And so some of these females will actually pick up cubs that aren't their own and, and take them with them and you know nourish them. And so these female bears are really, really good mothers. They're kind of maternally primed to take care of their young. And you know, that's really important in terms of the life history of the species is because females keep their young for up to two and a half years. And so during that time, females are teaching their cubs how to hunt on the sea ice, how to catch seals, where to go to look for food at different times of the year. And so 
this long kind of maternal investment we think is, is really important to individual survival. So these cubs really learning from their mothers on how to live in this very harsh Arctic environment. Polar bears are a relatively long-lived species. Um, on average, 24 to 28 years, men or, or male polar bears tend not to live as long as females. Uh, we think uh, the reduced survival in males in older age is probably related to reproductive investments. So these males really kind of um, invest heavily during the mating season. And so as a result, that kind of uh, wears them down over time. They start breaking their teeth. Uh, they get a little bit beat up and so uh, they have a harder time getting access to food. And when they get old, they also tend to, to lose body condition as well. You can see this individual's, you know, you can see his pelvic girdle here and his shoulders. He doesn't have very much fat on him, so um, he's on his, uh, on his way out. Polar bears are also a, a sexually sized dimorphic species, so there's a difference in size between the males and the females. Uh, this is a male that's harassing a female with a, a yearling cub and so she's just telling him to get away because uh, she's protecting her offspring but um, they, they, they tend to be uh, um, males, males grow longer than females so this particular male would probably invested eight to ten years in his growth whereas this female would have reached her asymptotic body size probably around five years of age so males invest more in growth probably because it's important for their individual reproductive success now, quite often we get the question, are polar bears intelligent? How smart are they? And so uh, this is a, a polar bear in a zoo in Japan. And basically, he's using a, a bunch of different things that are in the exhibit to try and get this piece of meat that's uh, on, a, on a hook in his, uh, in his enclosure. And so many of you um, probably are familiar with Jane Goodall and her work on, on chimpanzees. And one of her great discoveries was um, sitting and watching her, her troop of uh, study animals one day and one of the chimps, I think it was David Greybeard, went over and stripped a stick and took that stick and put it into a termite mound so it could, he could feed on the, the termites who were inside this hard termite mound. And you know, that was a major discovery that kind of changed our relationship and how we think of our closest relatives and you know, how we perceive intelligence in apes. But um, Again, here, here's a polar bear basically making use of different tools in his exhibit to try and get this piece of, piece of meat um, off a hook. And so they're, they are very smart animals. And if you talk to zookeepers, they say the two most dangerous animals to look after in a zoo setting are tigers and polar bears because they're basically spending most of their time sitting around thinking about how they can catch you. And um, <coughs> I have a colleague that works at the San Diego Zoo doing a lot of interesting physiology work with bears and they train them to walk on treadmills and do all sorts of um, uh, different behaviors so we can learn more about their physiology, their hearing. But this particular bear will push its toy frisbee that it likes to chase around its exhibit just like under the bars in its enclosure and sit and wait and watch if anybody comes along and tries to grab it. And even though they have a good relationship with the keepers, it'll still try and take a swat at them. So, I mean, the keepers know the game and they just kind of push it back in with a stick. But uh, yeah, the polar bears are, are, are very smart animals. So um, just a little bit on polar bear diets. So their primary prey are ring seals and bearded seals. These are um, the two most abundant seals sort of across the polar bears range, but they do have a really diverse diet. Harbor seals, uh, walruses, they scavenge. Um, beluga carcasses, sometimes they feed on other bears. Unfortunately, they get into garbage dumps and create issues in camps. Um, this is a picture of a polar bear in Svalbard that actually caught a reindeer. Um, and then this is a couple of polar bears that got the drop on, on Santa Claus. So they're opportunistic and uh, really willing to eat anything that's, uh, that's an easy meal. So uh, polar bears are carnivores, but polar bear biologists like to refer to polar bears as lipovores. So polar bear life history is really dependent on marine mammal fat and blubber. This caloric rich food resource is kind of what makes polar bears um, uh, lives go round. They really need the, the rich blubber from these marine mammals to go through periods of fasting. So uh, particularly in the winter time when it's cold and dark, polar bears aren't killing a lot of seals. Um, so they have to subsist on their stored body reserves and then when the ice melts again in the summertime they also have to live off their body fat. And so if uh, things are good and polar bears are killing a lot of seals 
quite often they'll strip them just like this. They'll eat the fat off and they'll leave the muscle tissue and the viscera and just kind of high grade on that blubber. So a little bit about polar bear energetics. So the polar bears are catching seals and food, but they need to allocate that energy to different um, aspects of their life history from body maintenance uh, to activity and growth and reproduction. So what happens when their energy stores go down? So the ice is melting, they have less access to their primary prey. Um, they're increasing their activity because the ice is more fragmented. They have less energy, so growth uh, reduces. We also see declines in reproduction as a result of shifts in the energy budgets of polar bears. And so that has implications for the long-term persistence of the species in the Arctic. And so I'm going to draw fairly heavily on a, a research program I've been involved with um, through my PhD and um, over uh, the last 38 years, researchers in Environment and Climate Change Canada have been going to Churchill, Manitoba to study the polar bears here on the coast of Western Hudson Bay. This is the first polar bear population in Canada to show the impacts of climate change, but it's also the most well-studied polar bear population in the world. And so um, this is just a movement track for some radio collar bears. And so these bears go out on the sea ice and they have a home range and they all kind of differ. But the nice thing about Churchill is the bears come back on shore in kind of a reliable locations kind of along the coast of the bay here. And so <clears throat> in general, polar bears on the sea ice occur at very low densities, one to 10 individuals per thousand square kilometers. And so when you're out working in that sea ice environment, trying to catch polar bears, actually finding one is a huge part of the job. But in Churchill, Manitoba, when the ice melts, and all these white polar bears show up on land that's you know kind of brown and gravelly and rocky they're really easy to spot and it, it's 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 not um, not um, that hard to to locate them and in, in a given day you know we can catch up to 10 polar bears in a day and, and take specimens and measurements and so we typically do this via helicopter so we go out looking for bears um, in the spring and the fall time and on average we catch between 100 and 150 bears a year so that gives us good sample size to look at a number of different things from contaminants to genetics to life history and individual survival every individual gets a unique identification so a tattoo on the inside of their upper lip so that allows us to track individual bears over time to look at individual investment in reproduction and growth and survival uh, we take standard measurements um, Right here you can see two, uh, two researchers taking the straight line body length of an immobilized polar bear. And then we can also take a, a vestigial premolar. So this is a tooth they don't really use for anything, but the tooth has growth annuli in it. So just like the growth rings in a tree, we can section that tooth. We can actually determine how old an individual is. And so that allows us to look at age and sex specific reproduction and survival in polar bears. So it tells us uh, a little bit more about their life history. And so we can also look at sea ice dynamics in this part of the world. Sea ice is important for polar bears, obviously. And so we can quantify that using uh, NASA satellite imagery. And this is our, our primary study area where most of our individuals spend their time when they're not on land in the winter when they're out hunting for seals. And we can look at trends in sea ice over time. And so this is a couple of graphs of, of sea ice trends in uh, Western Hudson Bay in relation to our long-term study population. Uh, and on average, the ice is breaking up around three weeks earlier. So in the springtime, seals are giving birth to their pups. And these pups are relatively naive. They don't know about predators and they're a really easy food source for polar bears. And so the polar bears really make out really well hunting these seal pups. And so when you decrease that sort of spring feeding period, it really impacts the energetics of bears. So they have less time on the ice to hunt their food and then they have to come on shore and fast for the summertime. Similarly, in the fall time, um, the ice is forming later and later, so around two weeks later on average from 1979 to 2015. So the rugs kind of getting pulled out from underneath their feet in the springtime, they're forced on shore, and the amount of time they're spending on land is getting longer and longer. So, so as the climate warms, we see you know, this feeding period where they you know, rely on the sea ice to get access to seals. But we see the, the fasting periods getting longer and longer. And so we're sort of pushing the, the energetic, um, energetics of these bears and kind of their physiological ability to deal with periods of uh, food deprivation. So this is a ultra fat female, one of the, 
the chunkiest uh, bears I think we ever caught. When she walked, her stomach actually dragged on the ground. Like that's how obese she was. Uh, she was pregnant and so they actually put this VHF transmitter. This was back in the 1980s, this picture. And she was so fat, she didn't walk during the daytime. She got too hot. So she would wait till nighttime and then she'd kind of walk inland and, and rest for a day. And she was going inland to the maternity denning area. So females typically move away from the coast to get away from large adult males to, to find a maternity den site for their cubs. And so um, this is kind of, you know, an extreme example of how fat a polar bear can get. But um, uh, this is, you know, and also an example of how skinny they can get. And we're seeing more of these kind of bears now in our study than we see these kind of bears. And so we can score bears a variety of different ways to look at their energetic reserves. Well, one of the, you know, um, most predictive scales is just a one to five scale we have. And so she would be a five and these individuals would be a one. And so um, we don't see very many fives anymore. And we're seeing a lot more kind of twos and ones than we used to. So bears are getting skinnier uh, in relation to changes in sea ice dynamics. And so that creates concerns for the long-term persistence of the population. So one of the other things we see with changing sea ice dynamics is polar bears are actually swimming more now. And so these are radio collar data from uh, uh, Alaska as well as Western Hudson Bay. And so when the ice is melting out all in really bad ice years, when it gets fragmented, the bears kind of have to make a decision on whether to stay on the ice or whether actually to swim back to land. And so um, some individuals can make swims in excess of 500 kilometers, and that's really energetically costly and potential has uh, survival implications for some individuals. Uh, this is a bear that was <coughs> observed on the coast of Alaska following an extreme storm event. And so um, they're actually flying surveys for bowhead whales and they observed a whole bunch of drowned polar bears and then subsequently some drowned polar bears along the coast. And so basically, you know, the bears are really good swimmers, but if the ocean gets really rough and there's big storms, there's only, you know, a certain, a certain amount of uh, uh, waves that they can deal with and then subsequently individuals start drowning. But this particular graph shows uh, the proportion of individuals in, in the population that are swimming in any given year and the rate of open water gain. And so as the ice kind of fragments and melts quicker and quicker in any given year, the number of individuals that actually end up having to swim increases. And so if you can imagine, the bears are out all walking on the sea ice. And if the sea ice is kind of really rotten in any given year and it was kind of a warm winter, if all that ice melts really quick, they don't have time to jump from pan to pan to try and navigate where they want to be in the summertime. Basically everything just melts and they're all stuck swimming. And so this potentially can have uh, survival implications for individuals and particularly females with young cubs that aren't able to thermoregulate as well. So what happens when these bears get on land? So they're spending more and more time on land, but what do they do when they come on land? And so um, this is actually some research we did with some colleagues, seabird biologists in our research division. They're seeing more and more seabirds in, uh, or more and more polar bears in seabird colonies now. And so this is the, the proportion of days that polar bears were present in some long-term study sites on uh, thick-billed murres and black guillemots in uh, the Canadian Arctic. And so you can see when the ice season length and days is long, so the ice is sticking around longer, the bears have more time to forage on seals they don't really see a lot of bears showing up in the seabird colonies. But when the ice season length gets shortened, they're seeing more and more bears. And so these bears come onto land, they're nutritionally stressed because they haven't had enough time to hunt seals, and they're going and looking for food. This is some research that I've been involved in looking at um, polar bear foraging in eider colonies. And so basically we looked at uh, the energetic benefits of bears foraging on these food resources. So people often ask, can polar bears adapt to climate change? Can they, can they change in some way or use some alternative food resource to potentially buffer themselves from the impacts of reductions in sea ice? And all the work that we've been able to do to look at terrestrial, terrestrial foraging suggests that, you know, eating bird eggs or the odd seabird really doesn't give polar bears the energetics or the, the, the calories they, they need to meet their energetic demands. And so this is just looking at adult body condition predicted over time into the future, as well as sub-adult body condition. And all the information we collected on observations of polar bear foraging in these seabird colonies and the, the calories they were taking in simply doesn't suggest that um, that'll benefit the bears in any significant way.
And so one of the other issues with bears spending more time on land is human polar bear interactions. And so this is actually data kind of looking at what bears do before the ice comes back in the fall. And this is from the polar bear alert program in Churchill, Manitoba. So in Churchill, Manitoba, they have a polar bear jail. So problem bears go into jail <coughs> if they come into the community and creating conflicts. And so this is the number of bears uh, handled by the Manitoba conservation officers and the date of sea ice breakup. And there's a lot of scatter around here, but the general trend is when the bears are spending longer on land and waiting for that ice to freeze up, as you get later, later into the fall and they're kind of dwindling down their energetic reserves in any given year, we end up seeing more problem bears. And so, you know, that creates human polar bear conflicts, um, you know, the potential for people getting injured, but also all bears as well. So this is um, using actually some of the data from, from the polar bear jail in Churchill, Manitoba. So when the bears go to jail, Manitoba Conservation catches them. They put them in this um, holding facility and then the bears stay there for several weeks until the ice reforms. Once the ice comes back, all the bears are immobilized again and then put back out on the sea ice and they don't come back to town. They're happy to be out on the ice and hunting seals. But one of the things we get in that program is a weight of the bear before it goes into the facility and a weight of the bear when it comes out. And so we can look at uh, mass loss rates over time in individual bears, which tells us something about how much energy they're using when they're just lying around. So when these bears are on shore, if they're not doing anything, how much energy they're using and basically how long can they go on the energetic reserves they have. And so this is just looking at some different age and sex classes, uh, adult males, sub-adults and so what we see over time is that time and days and this is the proportion of uh, individuals that would likely starve based on the energetics so polar bears can actually go a long time without eating you know um, it's nothing for them to go 120 140 150 days without getting access to feed food but when you really start pushing things out to the the 200 day limit which is you know over six months without food uh, we really start to see impacts on basically the, the ability of these bears to buffer that environmental variability in the system. And so we're kind of, we're starting to push them now pretty heavy, particularly at the southern portion of the range in Western Hudson Bay in terms of their physiological limits to deal with um, reductions in the availability of sea ice. So how is this influencing the demography of populations? And so um, using capture and mark recapture studies, because we have known individuals in our study population, we can estimate things like survival rate. And so this is um, survival rate of uh, sub-adult and senescent bears. So senescent bears would be bears over 20 years of age. So those older bears that I uh, showed a picture of at the beginning of the presentation and sub-adult bears are bears between two and four years of age. So adults tend to be pretty good at buffering themselves against the variability in the system. But these really young individuals, their survival drops fairly significantly in, in poor sea ice years. And so, you know, quite often in, in research and uh, as a biologist, you're kind of looking for these big events in the system. And so in 1990, we had a really, really early breakup uh, in the Western Hudson Bay system. The bears were forced ashore in the first week of June, which was uh, the earliest uh, we had ever seen it in the study population. So we see this, this drop in survival. There's some variation, you know, lots of individual variation, but in general, a drop in survival in that particular year. And interestingly enough, two years later, this is 1992, survival was actually quite high for this, these, uh, these age group of bears. And in 1991, Mount Pinatubo blew up in the Philippines, and that spewed a whole bunch of ash into the Earth's atmosphere and actually dropped global temperatures by around half a degree. And so, you know, we kind of see this variation in the system and what's happening when we change the Earth's climate just by a little bit and how it's reflected in the response of uh, the demography of this particular population of bears. So, and over the long term, what does this mean for this particular study population where we have really good data? Um, over the long term, this is up to 2011, we're work, working on reanalyzing um, this, uh, these data and kind of extending kind of the population trend up to 2018. Um, but in general, we've seen around a 30% decline in this population. So 
reductions in individual body condition, reductions in survival, and, and really um, poor sea ice years, and um, reductions in individual body condition, particularly adult females. Uh, so females going into the denning area, that really fat female I showed you with the transmitter on her head, um, she came out with triplets the next year, probably because she was in such great condition. Now we're seeing females that are leaving the denning area early. They're actually coming out in early January when their cubs actually can't survive in the, in the environment, but basically they're kind of at the end of their energetic reserves and they're basically looking at their own individual survival. So they're foregoing staying in the den um, and they're taking their cubs with them, but the cubs aren't surviving. So we're seeing reductions in recruitment and so we kind of have this chain of change. So we have climate warming. We all know it's, it's happening. It's altering the sea ice. It's changing the availability of polar bears' food. They have to move more in these dynamic ice environments as the ice becomes more fragmented. They're spending more time on land, so they're fasting longer. We're seeing individuals lose body condition. The bears are getting thinner and thinner over time. We're seeing fewer lighter cubs and, and lower cub survival. And we think this is kind of the the chain of change that's driving um, the reductions in that particular population of bears. So we're also seeing changes in growth. So an individual can allocate energy to a bunch of different things in terms of its life history, survival, reproduction, body maintenance and growth. But we're actually seeing now is polar bears are actually smaller than they used to be. So this is uh, body length for different cohorts of adult females. So this is basically just the year a bear was born. And this is all the bears that were born in 1960. And so you can see as we move down to cohorts in 2010, these bears are actually quite a bit shorter than the bears um, in the early portion of our study period. And so we have data on individuals from 1960, even though our uh, research program started in 1980, because we can take those teeth and we can actually section them and back age these individuals. So you know, individuals that we were catching in 1980 that were 20 years old were obviously born in, in 1960. So that gives us kind of ability to hind cast and see what was happening with this population of polar bears um, in the past. And so we see similar trends for adult males. Um, this rate of change in Haldanes, that's just an evolutionary measure, but basically it's um, um, a measure of a change in any trait in an individual in terms of standard deviations. Uh, per generation. So a generation time for polar bears is um, approximately 15 years. But um, the unique thing about this particular measure is it's an extremely rapid rate of change. I mean, if polar bears keep shrinking at this rate in about 900 years, <coughs> they'll be about the size of chipmunks. And um, we know that's not going to happen. They're, you know, they only have so much phenotypic plasticity uh, for their growth. But um, these are actually fairly rapid rates of uh, declines in body body size in a, in a large mammal like polar bears. So why is this potentially important? So I mentioned earlier we have this excellent genetic pedigree and we can look at male reproductive success. So there's a lot of individuals that don't sire any cubs and there's a couple of really lucky guys out here at the end of the curve that um, have uh, 12, 13, 14 cubs in their, in their lifetime. But the average male only sires two cubs in his life and so why is this? And so one of the reasons is there's, there's age-specific variation in reproduction in polar bears. So if you look at male reproductive success, this is the blue line here on the graph. This is relative age-specific reproductive output. Males sire around 67% of their cubs between around 11 and 19 years of age. And so this is when they're in their prime. This is when they're kind of at their peak body mass. And this is when they're kind of most competitive to gain access to estrus females. If you look at female reproduction over time, it's kind of flatter. So females kind of get in early at six or seven years of age and their reproduction is fairly constant. They're, you know, raising litters, having litters, you know, uh, weaning their cubs. And they kind of, they're in it for the long term. But these males are kind of basically only really competitive in the mating season uh, for a relatively short period in their lives. So male reproductive success is being bigger, better for polar bears. It is. So this is actually um, body length just measured in standard deviation. So an average bear would be at around zero here and a really big bear would be out at three. And so if you look at lifetime reproductive success, 
Um, this is just using uh, univariate selection differentials, which is just a regression, regression technique used by evolutionary ecologists to look at influence of traits on um, uh, fitness of individuals. We see bigger bears tend to have more cubs. And so with bears getting smaller, what does that mean? And that's uh, two standard deviations. So we think, and potentially, and this is something we're working on, but there could be changes in gene flow. So I mentioned these bears in Western Hudson Bay are getting sh smaller. So they may not actually be as competitive in the mating system out in, in Hudson Bay. And so, <coughs> pardon me, if they're less competitive, we could actually see genes coming in from adjacent populations. And we do have some genetic data to suggest that this is actually already happening. Which is uh, uh, genetic estimates of increase in effective population size. So this is the number of individuals that we think are, are breeding in any given year is increasing even though the population is declining, which suggests we're getting a gene flow from these adjacent populations in Southern Hudson Bay and, and Fox Basin. And so this is, creates kind of a, a unique situation. So polar bears are a size dimorphic species. Through our pedigree work, we've been able to s say that there's sexual selection on body size. So individual mating success is dependent on how big a male is. <coughs> so there should be positive selection on body size. Bears should be getting bigger, but body size is actually getting smaller. And so the question is whether that's a result of natural selection. So are fast growing individuals in a given year potentially penalized for their increased energetic demand? So if you're a young cub, you're kind of pre-programmed to grow to be big because your dad was big and he was successful in the mating system. What happens when sea ice conditions are really poor for that cub that's primed for a large amount of growth in a bad year when its mother stops lactating, her body condition's too low? Could there potentially be a short circuit in terms of sexual selection in the population and natural selection? Sexual, selec sexual selection selects for larger individuals in the study population but natural selection might favor against fast growing individuals because they burn up their energetic reserves quicker than everybody else. And so this is something we're thinking about. It's really interesting from a kind of evolutionary ecology perspective that, you know, um, sexual selection and natural selection could be uh, competing in terms of polar bear body size. So now I'm gonna talk just a little bit about polar bears as indicators of change in Arctic marine ecosystems. So we know about a lot about impacts uh, of climate change on polar bears, but they can also tell us about what's happening in Arctic marine ecosystems. So uh, polar bears eat a lot of different prey and the prey varies by different subpopulations. So this is Northern Beaufort Sea and Southern Beaufort Sea. So this is Western Canadian Arctic, uh, Yukon Coast uh, and NWT really uh, heavily reliant on, on ring seals and bearded seals in that part of the Arctic. Whereas in Western Hudson Bay, they have a little bit more diverse diet and more and more we're seeing harbor seals now. And harbor seals are typically an open water species, not a species that typically occurred in the Arctic um, 20, 30 years ago, but they're becoming more prevalent now. And we know this because we're actually picking them up more and more in polar bear diets. And so the polar bears can tell us something about shifts in range distribution of other species in the system. Similarly, they can tell us about changes in distribution of harped and hooded seals, which we're seeing moving further and further north in, in some of these particular subpopulations. So they can also act as uh, indicators of a species pre presence and changes in distribution. Um, they can also potentially tell us about differences in abundance. So this is just interannual variation in polar bear diets uh, in, in, in Hudson Bay. And as I mentioned, harbor seals are becoming more and more prevalent when we look at diets over time. This is some older data from a PhD student we had working in the lab. And so, you know, we see some years bearded seals are really low. Harbor seals appear to be becoming more important over time. And so bearded seals are also an ice dependent species. So the question is, are they being impacted by changes in ice dynamics in Hudson Bay? And we don't have a lot of good research on that, but um, potentially so. Uh, just a couple more slides here on sort of the, the research side of things. Uh, polar bear brown bear hybridization. This is, <coughs> pardon me, received a little bit of attention in the media. And so um, I was actually fortunate enough to be involved in uh, some work on, uh, on this, the unique uh, relationships between polar bears and, and, and brown bears. 
So they've been referred to as pizzly bears or, or growler bears. Um, they're kind of funny looking critters. Um, this was uh, a bear we actually ended up catching um, in a study area in Viscount Melville Sound in this small little bay here. And so they typically have this black along their dorsal part of their body, um, kind of dark around the eyes and on, on the forepaws. And it's a little bit hard to see, but um, they tend to kind of have um, intermediate sort of foot pads. So a polar bear's foot pad is covered with quite a bit of fur to give it some traction while it's w walking on the ice, whereas a grizzly bear's paw is almost uh, uh, completely uh, free of, of hair and fur. And so these, these hybrids kind of have these mottled feet. They're kind of uh, interesting to look at if you're, you know what you're looking at. But um, we've seen eight of these hybrids in the Western Canadian Arctic. And um, we've actually caught some brown bears as well. And so uh, you can see one location of a brown bear here. And this actual individual was actually the father of this um, F1 hybrid. But we've also found um, second generation hybrids now. So they appear to be able to back cross. And so polar bears evolved from brown bears. And estimates are anywhere from 150,000 to three and a half million years ago. And it, it's constantly bumping around. But um, they are very closely related species evolutionary. And so they can exchange genes and the hybrids seem viable. And so um, this is kind of an interesting kind of outcome potentially of climate change as well. We're seeing more and more brown bears moving up into the Canadian Arctic. So they're kind of expanding the distribution of their range. And so they're coming in contact with polar bears up here in the Arctic islands. And uh, one of the unique things about um, dispersal for brown bears is males tend to kind of wander off further. So females will quite often give a, a portion of their home range to their, to their offspring. Um, but the male males tend to wander further and so we see a lot of male grizzly bears up here but not a lot of female grizzly bears so when the breeding season starts and love is in the air and they're they're out looking for a girlfriend and there's no no brown bears around that are female this is kind of I guess the next best option for them so we think that may be one of the reasons um, that we're seeing more of these hybrids is that you get all these male polar bears pushing, or sorry, male grizzly bears pushing up into the Arctic islands, and um, there's no female brown bears to breed with. So I guess uh, polar bears are the next best thing. And so uh, I talked a little bit about <coughs> adaptations for polar bears and whether they'll be able to evolve to make use of terrestrial diets, and we just really don't think that's going to happen. We've looked at diets in a number of different ways from stable isotopes to fatty acids to these energetic studies looking at bears foraging through these seabird colonies um, but you know we really don't think that you know polar bears are going to be able to kind of move back to this kind of brown bear ancestral state where they can make use of terrestrial food resources the pace of climate change is is too quick um, and they just you know they're so highly adapted for the life they have now in the Arctic marine environment that they just can't switch back to this um, to eating fish or berries or, or seabirds and things so so obviously climate change is, is impacting um, polar bears and in particular Arctic marine ecosystems so I mean there's there's you know a whole variety of species you know from polar bear prey ring seals bearded seals walrus being impacted by climate change you know and the whole kind of uh, Aponta community in the sea ice. And so uh, kind of we need a plan. And sometimes it's a little bit depressing giving talks on climate change and polar bears because you kind of wonder what's, what's the future. But um, there's actually a really kind of influential paper that I'm going to touch on before I kind of uh, sum things up for you guys here today. And that's the greenhouse mitigation can reduce ice loss and increase polar bear persistence. So um, I was fortunate enough to be involved in the... Um, the um, endangered species assessment for polar bears in the United States back in 2007 where it was listed as a threatened species so we contributed data and scientific expertise to that and so but one of the unfortunate things that came out of that is this perception that polar bears are doomed that you know there's there's no potential for the species in the long term and so um, a colleague of mine Steve Amstrup with a, a number of other people went back and and looked at it and basically said you know if we actually hit some of our targets, you know, we'll still see a decline into the future in terms of reductions in, in September sea ice extent. So this is the amount of sea ice kind of covering polar, uh, the polar area. Um, 
in the north. Um, so it might decline a bit, but it can also rebound. And so, you know, depending on how fast we get on board with climate change, you know, mitigation and trying to reduce emissions and trying to meet some of these targets will kind of influence what the future uh, for polar bears will be. And so what will the future be? Obviously, that'll depend on all of us. You know, will it be a future where polar bears are trying to eke out an existence, you know, living off seabird eggs and this particular individual's feed is actually, this is actually yolk from eider eggs. So this bear has eaten so many eggs and crushed so many nests, it's actually got orange forepaws. But um, yeah, hopefully there's a future with sea ice and polar bears for, for everybody to enjoy. And that's, uh, that's definitely a, a potential reality if we are uh, smart about how we address climate change. So a whole bunch of different uh, supporting agencies for our research over the long term, you know, from scholarships to, um, you know, major grants and a number of people to support um, field and lab work. I'm part of a really large research team that collects all these data and, you know, produces the analysis and the graphs and things that help us understand how polar bears are responding to climate change. But with that, I'll kind of uh, conclude my lecture and I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys have. Thank you.